We arrived at Eyemouth from Stromness at 4.30 on the 30th of June. Eyemouth is only seven miles from the border with England, so we'd essentially done the whole of eastern Scotland in one leg of 36 and a half hours, logging 211 miles. The North Cardinal buoy marking the rocky reef outside the bay is a good deal smaller than we were expecting, and the entrance to the harbour is intimidatingly tight. In strong northerlies or easterlies, entry will be dangerous. We knew that depths alongside the visitor's pontoon could get quite shallow at low water, but it was near the top of the tide when we entered, and depth wasn't an issue. We had phoned the harbour master to find a berth, and his deputy told us to raft up alongside one of the yachts already there. There was one vacant alongside berth, but obeying our instructions we tried to raft up, and were met with the usual excuses from the moored boats about leaving early the next morning. As we were circling, assessing which boat to ignore, a west alerter follows us in, made for the alongside berth. I called him to see if he'd check with the harbour master, only for one of the crew to respond that he was the harbour master. However, he added that once he was berthed, we could raft up alongside him. He also pointed out that it was as well we had not arrived earlier, as the harbour had silted up and there was a metre less depth than showed on the gauge for the entrance to the inner harbour, where a hump had formed across the channel. After our marathon motoring session, I emptied both of our jerry cans into the main tank and found a garage to top them up. I was pretty sure we then had enough diesel to get us home, even if we had to motor the whole way. Eyemouth is supposed to be a holiday resort, but despite the good weather, it was almost deserted, and the only place we found serving any food after eight was a curry house. Apart from a good beach, Eyemouth had two major attractions. The first was the Maritime Museum. When Exeter Maritime Museum closed, most of the exhibits were brought into Eyemouth, and pseudo gallium built to house them. This looks good, but it's nowhere near as big as the warehouses in Exeter, and most of the exhibits are stored away from public view. I'd last seen this junk floating on the Exeter ship canal. The other attraction is Gunscreen House, which was designed by Robert Adam around 1755, and belonged to the chief smuggler hereabouts. There are various hideaways under the house, but the most entertaining one was where he kept his tea. Essentially one chimney stack was a giant tea caddy. Chests were poured into a hopper via an upper fireplace, and clients brought their small caddies to be pilled from a dispenser in a lower fireplace. This was a thriving enterprise until the taxes on luxury goods was reduced to the point where the risks were no longer worth it. We left Eyemouth on the 2nd of July at 9.45, with over 25 knots of westerly wind, and two reefs in. This was okay for half an hour, but the wind dropped to below 20 knots, and we knocked the reefs out again. We had hoped to anchor inside Holy Island, but the pilot describes the anchorage as being uncomfortable in strong westerlies, which is what we still had. Amble would have been an option, but we wanted to make more progress, and being a half-tide harbour it would have constrained our departure the next day, so we decided to head for Blythe. That meant we had a brisk close hauled sail along the Northumbrian coast, in flat water, and with a new castle to see every few miles. Lindisfarne Castle on Holy Island was built on the rocky crag using material from the abandoned priory. Work was completed in 1550, and the castle was used to defend the harbour of Holy Island against the Scots and their allies the French. However, the only attack came in 1715, when the castle was briefly seized by the Stuarts. A 6th century fortification at the site of Bamburgh was replaced by a Norman castle in 1095. Over the next hundred years, building work gradually replaced the earlier wooden stone constructions, and by the time of Henry III, the castle was well established over an area of five acres. During the Border Wars, the castle stood successfully against bombardment. However, during the Wars of Roses, it changed hands at least five times and became the first stronghold in England to be breached by gunfire.
passing Bambra Castle, we sailed inside the Farne Islands. Dunstanborough Castle is unusual in not being built on the site of a previous fortification. It was built in the 14th century by Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, the most powerful baron in the reign of Edward II. The impressive three-storey gatehouse was built between 1313 and 1325. The second gatehouse was added 60 years later. During the Wars of the Roses, the castle was besieged by the Yorkists. We arrived at Blythe at 7 o'clock, having logged 62 miles at an average of 6.7 knots. Blythe has got nothing to recommend it as far as scenery goes, unless you're a connoisseur of mid 20th century industrial Dockland architecture. However, it is one of the few all tide, all weather harbours on this coast, and the Royal Northumberland Yacht Club provides a warm welcome in its antique lightship clubhouse. The club ensign is very similar to our own and we had constantly been mistaken for members all around Scotland, so we felt we just had to call in. Our next destination was south to Whitby. Blythe boasts the most useless set of wind turbines in the whole country. The ones on the breakwater operate at just 6% efficiency, and the offshore ones are suffering from subsidence. We left the next morning at 5.30 to make best use of the tide, although being towards Neeps it was not particularly strong. To start off with we had a boat speed of 7.5 knots under sail, but soon the wind eased and we had to motor sail to keep the speed up. Some people had got up even earlier than we had. The entrance at the time was much less industrialised than I'd expected. As we approached the entrance to Whitby, the Trinity House vessel Patricia appeared from the south, pulled across our bows as though she was going to go into the harbour. That would have been impossible, but for a while it looked as though she was going to try. But she stood off and dropped a boat in the water. We moored up at a holding jetty at 12.45 after logging 49 miles at an average of 6.7 knots. <laughs> 